they've actively avoided war, you know, with Russia. They we've essentially could have sponsored a proxy conflict, you know, in Ukraine by supplying arms and weapons. And and despite all the kind of Macron's comments, uh, you know, about troops and uh, David Cameron's comments about storm shadow missiles, you know, being used in Russia. We've always avoided deploying NATO troops uh, to Ukraine because we haven't wanted to get sucked into into that conflict. But on the flip side, we haven't wanted peace either. You know, we haven't really wanted to kind of engage in a process that would lead to you know Russia and Ukraine over the long term resolving their challenges, coming to some sort of uh, consensus and compromise on on the Donbass and you know Crimea as well and now these additional two oblasts you know that, that russia has seized since the war has started everything that we've done has avoided the, the possibility you know of direct negotiation with putin who we you know want to cancel you know we don't like putin let's not talk to putin let's sanction absolutely everything russia exclude russia you know from everything so all the actions say that we don't want peace either so Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to a former British diplomat. Mr. Ian Proud was a member of the British Diplomatic Service from 1999 until 2023. During that time, he worked in Thailand and Afghanistan, as well as many years directly from 10 Downing Street. His most eventful posting, however, was the position as economic counselor at the UK Embassy in Moscow from 2014 to 2019 about which he recently published a book called A Misfit in Moscow, How British Diplomacy in Russia Failed. Well, this is what we want to talk about today. So, Mr. Proud, welcome. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's nice to kind of see you from such a distance. You're in Japan, I'm in England. Exactly. And we want to kind of dis discuss English or let's say British um, diplomacy today, and I would really like to focus a little bit with you on your book first, because you you unpack quite a bit of things. Although um, you write at the beginning that you are approaching um, British foreign policy from from a realist lens, and in the very first pages you reject this cartoonish depiction of Russia and Vladimir Putin as the puppet master of ev all and everything Russian. Um, could you explain a little bit why you why you decided to to start a book with something that these days is actually not very popular to say? Well, I was in Moscow for four and a half years, as you uh, correctly said, during a pretty tense time, actually, from the start of Western sanctions against Russia following the onset of the Ukraine crisis through the Salisbury nerve agent uh, attack and the mass expulsions of diplomats that followed. My abiding reflection from that time was that actually UK foreign policy towards Russia, but also wider Western, including American foreign policy towards Russia, was actually making the situation worse, not actually helping to kind of reduce tensions, not really helping to resolve uh, the ongoing conflict and tension with neighbouring uh, Ukraine. And is I suppose that sense of frustration that actually we need to kind of understand Russia better in order to kind of have a more um, engaging dialogue with Russia and with Ukraine about resolving these quite uh, deep-rooted uh, difficulties between those two countries. That makes a lot of sense, which is one of the reasons why me and many others are so frustrated when we when we hear in the media that um, all you need to know about Russia is that Putin is evil, and all you need to know is that we need to fight them with, them with more weapons. Um, yes. Where was the big miss? When did that happen? I mean, you you've you've seen the discourse about Russia develop, right? When was the big breaking point when you thought, oh, something's going seriously wrong in the way that public perception is being shaped toward Russia? I think really from the start of the Ukraine crisis, even before um, you know the Maidan um, demonstrations started to kind of bubble up in the run up to the. To the Vilnius summit of the Eastern um, Partnership, EU Eastern Partnership uh, summit, where certainly the press narrative in the UK was very much um, positioning that debate about Ukraine's membership of, of the an association agreement with Europe as some zero sum tussle between the West and and with Russia, where you know we had to win and Russia had to lose out of out of that sort of bargain. And it always occurred to me actually that for Ukraine long term their best interest will be served by having a really positive and a deeper relationship with the West, including economically and possibly politically, but also maintaining those long standings of ties with, with Ukraine. And it's that sense that actually that 
that Ukraine had to choose between, you know, Russia and that old system, you know, that system of failure from the Soviet period and and this bright and perfect and liberal, liberalizing kind of West. And I never really felt that was a legitimate choice because actually, you know, Ukraine has deep uh, roots into Europe, but also deep roots into Russia. And, you know, the idea that they should choose between the two, it always felt ludicrous to me. And but this this choice was not something that was imposed on Ukraine from the Russian side, right? This was a this was a decidedly EU thing to do. They uh, back in two thousand fourteen, the association agreement, Ukraine had two offers on the table. One the Russian one that said we don't mind if you if you have one with with the EU as well, and the EU one that said you can have ours only <laughs> if you if you pick the Russian one, ours is gone. Um, and this is not a British, well, yeah, it was a British decision as well. I mean, Britain was part of the EU. I mean, only in two thousand sixteen we came the came the came the big the big break. Um, what was the British position when that happened? This this kind of this black and white moment of like m making the Ukrainians choose. The UK was absolutely supportive of that position. I mean, you know, we had reservations about the EU, the Eastern Partnership uh arrangement and, and that sort of thing but but the idea of peeling ukraine off of uh you know russian influence was very much something that the uk was fully behind absolutely you know we we wanted uh you know ukraine to have this kind of brighter future on our side you know on our righteous kind of western uh, liberal side and away from russia so you know despite frictions within the eu family itself you know often prompted by the uk <clears throat> the UK sort of was very much supportive of the EU line on association agreement. And one of the challenges, of course, with the association agreement was that actually what ostensibly offered a, more of an economic uh, partnership with Ukraine had so many other political kind of uh, bits of baggage uh, attached to it, uh, you know, which created this kind of fallacy that, that Ukraine could only trade with, with EU and not actually also with Russia. But if you look at the most successful economies in the world, they actually trade with everybody. You know, Japan, you know, is a good example of that. You know, South Korea, you know, all these vibrant kind of Asian economies, you know, they don't pick and choose who they have a relationship with. They try and have a relationship, you know, globally. And I think that's, that's the big mistake. But the UK is very much, you know, behind that. Now, this is very interesting to hear from you who used to serve for the um the, the the british foreign foreign service although i must point out to everybody that um wherever you go um the foreign services tend to hire the brightest people into their into their services because you need a lot of people who speak a lot of languages and you they need to be very much connected now you then naturally go along and analyze uh, um analyze uh, inter international relations but and i need to point this out too in your book you write that before publishing the manuscript, you handed it over to the foreign office and they struck out about 4,000 words. Uh, you, so there was some censorship and you, you attest to that. Now, what are the things without saying them that today are not communicatable, even to somebody like you who retired? Well, the main thing about my book is it, it offers a personal opinion. And that that's the most important thing to remember about you know my book. It offers my personal opinion that I don't agree with UK foreign policy, uh, and I tried very hard to stick uh, to that. You know, when I wrote the book, I was very faithful to that um, that approach. But nevertheless, anything which suggests access or insight to anything that is secret, including the organisations of secrecy, like the intelligence organisations and, and things like that, any reference or even vaguest mildest reference to anything secret has to be kind of taken out and and while i while i didn't um intentionally kind of include anything secret because that was never you know my approach in writing the book there was a bit of a bargaining where you know still as you say four thousand words <laughs> had to come out of, of the text uh, to satisfy the the british government now a, a fundamental question because you approached the book in a, I think a very intellectually honest way by talking about this straightforwardly look there are things I know that I didn't write about and there are things I know that I wrote about it that were strict struck stricken out right um yeah. this this then asks the question so is what you wrote bias because we are swimming in propaganda at the moment right so in which sense do you think that even a a book that that doesn't reveal everything still can contribute to our understanding of you know British Russian relations in a like in an honest way. 
Well, I've approached it in as honest a way as I can. I think everybody has their biases, and I, I'm no different, uh, you know, from that. Obviously, during the the course of ten years, you know, uh, studying Russia, I had access to vast amounts of information, most of which I obviously can't share. But but in sharing my opinions, I try to give my personal and honest opinion based on my intellectual assessment of of all the insights I got, both you know, from UK government sources, but also from obviously living in Russia itself, you know, and meeting meeting Russian people. So I try to be as honest as I can. Clearly, people will disagree, and that's entirely fine. But but actually, one of the purposes of diplomacy is is to promote conversation. You know, nobody is 100% right about anything, you know, but actually, when we disagree, well, let's have a conversation about that, and find why we disagree, and maybe search for areas you know, where we can find some sort of common ground. So, you know, I don't claim to, to you know, have the most kind of perfect understanding of the situation, but this is this is my opinion in as unbiased a way that I've been able to, to write it, and I'm, I'm happy to kind of discuss that, you know, with anybody. That's a very good approach. So in a sense, even though we cannot know everything you know, I mean, we know that even the things that you don't share with us still lead you down to to having the opinion that you're sharing. So that's yes. what we can believe. Then um you you know you you write very interestingly that uh everybody argues now for many years, kind of uselessly, that we need to deter Russia. And the entire mm. war that we are seeing now, people before the war said we need to deter Russia, then the war happened, and we are still saying like we need to deter Russia. Uh, but you you then ask the question, deter from what? What exactly is it? What? How do you see that discourse developing? Well, you know, our, our aim really should be for Russia and, and Ukraine to be able to kind of coexist in a peaceful way with each other and manage and manage their tensions, and also for us, the UK, the EU, you know, the US. I can't talk for them, but but also to kind of coexist in a peaceable way with Ukraine and and with Russia. So you know. When you get into the language of deterrence, you're already setting up Russia as the enemy in, in that relationship. But but actually, you know, our aim should be to correct, prevent a situation where Russia feels that we are its enemy and it, it has to act in increasingly kind of hostile ways. And you know, arguably, you know, certainly if you look at the events that have unfolded over the past you know decade, you know, rather than deterring Russia, in fact, we've actually provoked Russia. You know, into some of the steps you know that it has taken through our deliberate kind of policy choices, you know, including on uh, the change of government in Ukraine in in February 2014, you know, and so on, including on uh, our blind support for you know uh, sanctions as the only kind of uh, way to uh, kind of punish uh, Russia and our inability to kind of encourage, if you like, Ukraine to to have a more positive. Uh, you know, dialogue with Russia in the interest of kind of resolving their differences, you know, rather than, you know, creating sort of, um, you know, views in Ukraine that actually, you know, will support all of their choices, whatever they are, good or bad. Why did that happen? Why is it that your vision of encouraging Russia and Ukraine to get along together and way before the 2022, right? Even 2014 to 2022, these eight years of the Minsk agreements and the Minsk process were supposed to bring that about, right? That was the idea of the Normandy format. Yeah. Um, why did that not materialize? Well, it didn't materialize because the US in particular, but also the UK were invested in seeing it fail. You know, the Minsk, uh, you know, process you know, was a the agreements weren't necessarily perfect, but they were a starting point for negotiations, you know, between the two sides, you know, between Ukraine and between the Septis and the Donbass with, you know, Russia, Germany, uh, France, uh, also involved in that process, uh, you know, and the OSCE. But but actually what the US and the UK did in particular was to kind of create this conditionality where, you know, sanctions on Russia would would remain in place until there was this bizarre notion of the full implementation of the Minsk uh, Minsk process. And if you bear in mind that any complex kind of political negotiation structure like the Minsk agreement would require decades to kind of fully work its way through. But actually, you know, by linking sanctions to this successful implementation of the Minsk idea, uh, we made sanctions against Russia permanent, which stoked resentment in Russia against uh, the West, but also disincentivized, actually, importantly, 
Ukraine from actually engaging with the Minsk process in good faith. If I if I take the other side and uh, and I, I I ask you about Mr. Proud, uh, it, wasn't it Russia that constantly uh, that constantly undermined the Minsk agreements? Uh, we hear that in the media all the time. It was Russia that sabotaged it, wasn't it? Well, Russia undoubtedly was providing military support to the Septus in the Donbass. I don't think even Putin has made any secret of that through veiled statements he's made at various fora. You know, he's been clear about Russian support for the Septus, but at the same time. You know, that happened in the context of Ukraine making no forward movement in its obligations to kind of find some sort of process towards devolution in the Donbass involving negotiations, you know, with the separatist leaders. Uh, and in fact, you know, just days before the, the, the war started, Dmitry Kaleba, the Ukrainian foreign minister, said that there would never be any uh, decentralization, you know, in the Donbass you know, essentially saying that Ukraine would never meet its obligations under the Minsk agreement. So, you know, both sides have done things that are wrong, and Russia's absolutely done things that are wrong. But right from the very beginning, knowing that actually implementation of Minsk by Ukraine would increase the likelihood that sanctions against Russia would be removed, there's never been any incentive for, for Ukraine to meet its end of the bargain. The... The, these times, the, these eight years, I mean, we've seen then the conflict in the Donbass flaring up again and again. And then these in the very pivotal days of January and February 2022, we've seen Mr. Zelensky even being at the Munich Security Conference uh, while while the, the Western side was talking about Russia having troops in, in um, next to Ukraine. And uh, I didn't believe that Russia was about to invade, and I was completely wrong about that. They were about to invade. But something that also happened was a, a massive increase in shelling of the Donbass regions, according to the OSCE uh, uh, accounts of this, which is in, in, in a neutral observer, right, at the moment, that just counted how many, how many infringements of the, of the ceasefire mm. Uh, happened so uh, do you um what did you make out of this situation in this january and february 2022 was was there an escalation from both sides going on well i think the escalation really started as soon as um joe biden became uh, president of the us and that very much you know emboldened a uh, ukraine in terms of its kind of military uh, build up in terms of its non-compliance with um you know the Minsk uh, deal and so on in terms of its uh you know aggressive posture towards you know uh, the Donbass and um you know undoubtedly kind of Russia w was was also kind of providing material support to the septus in the in the Donbass as well but but you know the West were helping to inflame the situation so much you know and you know leading to these statements by people like Dmitry Kaleba you know, about Donbass decentralization being completely off the table and things like that, that the, the situation became so inflamed that that we helped, you know, I mean, Russia Russia has to take ultimate responsibility for launching this you know, invasion against Ukraine, but but we helped to make that, uh, that flashpoint inevitable. And you were, um, you came back from Russia in 2019, um, and then you were working from London. And in 2022, you kind of came out of retirement again. You said in your book at some point, were you in office during in February, March, April, uh, 2022? Oh yes, no, of course I wasn't. I didn't actually retire until 2023, yeah. but I, I got pulled back into the kind of Russia sphere to basically to authorize sanctions. I mean, sanctions is my big area of expertise. And I, you know, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, unfortunately or, or not, you know, I was involved in authorizing hundreds of individual sanctions against uh, Russian people and against uh, Russian uh, companies. So, you know, I was involved, um, again, having given my experience in that process of these kind of futile sanctions you know, against Russia, just adding more and more and more uh, to no obvious uh, benefit. And there was this moment in uh, late March, early April, when the Istanbul process almost led to a peace agreement or at least a ceasefire agreement with a neutrality of Ukraine and so on. And then there's this infamous visit of your then Prime Minister Boris Johnson. And in, in my circles of the Internet, there's always this, this moment where everybody say, yeah, Mr. Johnson then told Zelensky not to go for it and fight it out. Um, 
was that so? Was that the case? Did Boris Johnson say he, he, you shouldn't you shouldn't make peace with the Russians? Do you know well, anything Boris about Johnson's that? made no secret of the fact that that's what he said. You know, in his public comments after that time, he's been clear that he didn't want Zelensky to agree. Uh, you know, to that to that process. So, you know, this isn't a secret. Look at Boris Johnson's uh, comments. You know, after that kind of peace process fell apart. You know, look at Liz Truss's comments. A few weeks later, a big speech uh, she made where, you know, she is urging Ukraine to fight on and retake, for example, you know, Crimea. So I don't think there's any doubt about that. We just need to kind of look at the, you know, publicly available statements made by both Boris Johnson, but also Liz Truss, who, who at that time was the incredibly hawkish, you know, foreign secretary of the UK. So, I mean, that's, that's no secret. There's no, there's no conspiracy there. I, I keep wondering why it is that we have all of these people on tape, including then also Angela Merkel and Hollande and and Pe uh, Petro Poroshenko, who all talked also about how the Minsk process was just supposed to buy Ukraine time so that it can be militarized against Russia. And we still have in the West a narrative that that is Russian propaganda. <laughs> can you explain that to yourself? Well, I think, to be honest with you, I mean, my personal view is that Merkel and, and um, Hollande are slightly retrofitting their narratives, uh, actually, because at the time, you know, the Minsk process was a very, very credible process. You know, the very first agreement, the very first uh, proposal, you know, on on um, managing the conflict in the Donbass was actually made by Poroshenko himself, you know, before the Minsk One agreement, you know. Um, uh, so actually, when... When the Minsk One agreement, you know, fell apart, uh, and Merkel and Hollande got involved and, and and brokered this, you know, a negotiation in Minsk with Lukashenko, you know, there and Putin and uh, Poroshenko, you know, that was a very serious effort, actually, to kind of broker some sort of a process, you know, whereby you know Ukraine and the separatists in the Donbas, you know, supported by obviously Russia in the room, you know, France, Germany, OSCE. Uh, could long term, you know, resolve that. So I think now it's slightly cheap, you know, to look back and say, well, this is all a fake. At the time, it's a very kind of serious uh, European uh, initiative of diplomacy. But you know, where it fell apart was that actually, you know, the UK was out of the room, had been out of the room since the start of the Normandy format, you know, in in the summer of um, in the summer of 2014. And actually, you know, the US didn't really see in their interest to kind of uh, support this because, as we know, you know, from Victoria Newland's involvement in in the Maidan protest uh, protests and the you know the overthrow of, of Yanukovych, that actually the Americans you know saw themselves in the lead more than the Europeans anyway. So. Thank you for that. I think you're right, because especially Merkel, you know, I also think it's not a coincidence that this war, the full scale of it broke out after she she retired. She had certain influence, especially on the neocons in in the US, but also in, in Europe to keep them keep a lid on them. Um, and Merkel, I think, was also very weary about being seen as a second Schroeder. She's, I mm. think she was very afraid of what happened to the public yeah. uh, appeal of her predecessor, Mr. Schroeder, and she didn't yeah, want that. So exactly. maybe the retrofitting, I think you're 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 right with that. Um, and, the, and the thing is, um, you know, I mean, Merkel and, and 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 Putin had this kind of famously, you know, quite strained, slightly frosty, you know, blunt relationship with the with each other. Obviously, you know, Putin, you know, can speak fluent German and that sort of thing. But how, however, during the time that I was in Moscow, you know, Europe, uh, German diplomacy with Russia was very, very active. You know, Steinmeier, the the foreign uh, minister at that time, was very, very active you know, under Merkel's leadership in engagement with Russia. So, despite the challenges in the relationship, there's a you know very active German foreign policy with Russia. So, you know, for Merkel to say that, I just find it slightly laughable, but that's just my opinion. That 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 does that does make sense. I mean, Merkel was the one who kept clinging also to Nord Stream one and two. I mean, because she understood the importance she did. of that thing. She did. Um and it went away under her under her under Mr. Schultz and well, the next question, I mean, whether you know or not, I'm, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't be able to say, but do you know who blew up the North, North Stream pipeline? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Um, uh, all, all I'll say is as soon as I as soon as I saw that news, you know, my, my first response would be that, you know, the Russians, you know, would be crazy to, to do that themselves. I've never really, not from the beginning, not now, not everything I've seen 
you know, since that time, some which I can't share with you. I've never really believed that the Russians would uh, would do that themselves. I mean, why would they? Why would they break off a vital energy link? Uh, you know, into into Europe. I mean, the whole time that I was in Moscow, the Russians were lobbying hard, really hard for Nord Stream two. Mm -hmm. Even with us, you know, the UK, and, and we got we get very little gas from Russia. Even then, it was less than two percent of UK, you know, gas was actually imported from Russia. But nevertheless, the Russians were lobbying everybody to get this pipeline, you know, agreed. You know, difficulties with the Poles, difficulties with the Danes, all sorts of legal challenges happening to this. Obviously, Merkel, as you say, kind of uh, clinging on to it. Um, you know, the, the people, you know, who wanted to maintain the old system, you know, the gas transit through Ukraine, which at the time was generating, you know, $3 billion a year in transit income, you know, were the Ukrainians. I mean, the Ukrainians and the Americans are the ones that didn't want Nord Stream 2 built. That's absolutely clear. But who actually kind of blew the pipeline up? I mean, gosh, who knows? Lots of speculation. I'm just personally, personally, I've just never really believed that the Russians would have done that. It would make it. It would the Russians would be shooting themselves so much in the foot if they if that actually was the case. Right. Um, anyhow, we we I think we can move away from from this question because what 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 is on my mind is really more how Europe managed to get from something like as you pointed out as good diplomacy. Minsk was good European diplomacy, maybe at its best when you don't agree, but you 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 come up with a process that if. If all parties more or less play along, you don't even have that to play hundred percent along, but you go ahead. And then we went to where we are now, which is a war which is still spiraling and still getting worse. And we are not talking about NATO troops in Ukraine. Um, do you see an end to this, or are we are we doomed to a fifth general war in Europe in four hundred years? Well, I hope we're not doomed to a war. I hope common sense will prevail, and you know, let's see what happens. Um... You know the biggest the biggest thing that will impact on what's happening in Ukraine is I hate to admit it, but the U.S. presidential election, you know, later this year that that will probably have the biggest influence on the on the trajectory of war um, uh, in Ukraine. But you know the, the challenge has always been uh, in Ukraine. One of the reasons that that we're in the position that we're in today is this what I describe as this choice between war or peace. You know, just to slightly riff off uh, Leo Tolstoy's. You know, famous uh, novel. You know, the, the the West. They've actively avoided war. You know, with Russia, they we've essentially kind of sponsored a proxy conflict. You know, in Ukraine by supplying arms and weapons, and and despite all the kind of Macron's comments, uh, you know, about troops and uh, David Cameron's comments about storm shadow missiles, you know, being used in Russia, we've always avoided deploying NATO troops uh, to Ukraine because we haven't wanted to get sucked into into that conflict but on the flip side we haven't wanted peace either you know we haven't really wanted to kind of engage in a process that would lead to you know russia and ukraine over the long term resolving their challenges coming to some sort of uh, consensus and compromise on on the donbass and you know crimea as well and now these additional two oblasts you know that, that russia seized since the war has started everything that we've done has avoided the, the possibility you know, of direct negotiation with Putin, who we you know want to cancel. You know we don't like Putin. Let's not talk to Putin. Let's sanction absolutely everything Russia, exclude Russia, you know from everything. So all the actions say that we don't want peace either. So you know actually what we're in today, this kind of proxy war in Ukraine, is this kind of horrible, um, you know, attritional um, uh, conflict in which you know the Ukraine. Uh, is frankly, you know, the biggest loser from this. And actually, you know, Russia still feels it's under threat and, and we still feel the need to defeat Russia. So nobody's winning in this situation.